I'm Philip Roberts, extension entomologist with the University of Georgia. I uh, work primarily on cotton and soybeans and uh, we're going to take a few minutes and talk about soybean IPM and, and more specifically uh, soybean insect pest management. Um, when we think of soybeans, uh, one of the things that, and I actually enjoy working on the crop, soybeans can really tolerate a lot of insects. And uh, insects like soybeans. Uh, but that's where scouting comes in. It's so important uh, that you scout your soybeans and all your crops. But soybeans in particular because uh, we're going to have pests out there most of the year. And the key is to scout the field. And if we have a population of insects out there that will cause economic damage, we need to intervene with an insecticide. Now another part of IPM is, you know, we only want to use insecticides when absolutely necessary. So in soybeans in particular, conservation of beneficial insects is extremely important. Uh, we've got numerous examples where if we make a spray for some insect and remove beneficial insects, we can run into problems with foliage feeding caterpillars such as soybean looper. So again, we want to make good decisions and only use insecticides when absolutely necessary. Now another thing with soybeans, at least in Georgia, we have what I would call four different production systems. Uh, we have some growers, growers who will plant indeterminate soybeans in March and April. Uh, those will typically be harvest in August and early September. Uh, we have what I call our normal full season soybeans that would be planted the latter part of April, early May. Those are usually like group five beans. I call those full season beans. We have double crop soybeans planted behind wheat. And we have a few growers who actually put soybeans in uh, following harvest of corn or harvest of silage. And those soybeans would be planted the end of July or 1st of August. But when you look at those four different production systems, uh, you know, I think it's good for you as a grower, you as a scout, to understand what the risk for various insect pests are. Now in general, the later you plant soybeans, the more at risk you are for having problems with insects. For example, our most common insect in the state of Georgia, number one pest of soybeans in the state of Georgia is stink bugs. The later you plant soybeans, the later the maturity group you plant, the more likely you are to encounter uh, problems with stink bugs. Same thing with foliage feeders, whether it's velvet bean caterpillar or soybean looper, and we'll visit on these in a little more detail here in a moment. The only exception is, a, is an insect called kudzu bugs. And actually, uh, when they were first introduced in the U.S., it's probably been 10, 11 years ago, for the first few years, numbers were really high in soybeans. Uh, but for the last three or four years, the numbers have been very low. Uh, we actually did spray some fields this year, but unlike other insect pests, the earlier you plant soybeans, the more at risk you are to kudzu bugs. So that insect is, uh, is a little backwards from what we typically think of. Now in terms of scouting, how do you scout soybeans? Well, there's basically four ways. Number one is just observation. Um, this is particularly true in the early part of the year. Uh, you're looking for seedling pests. You just walk the field and observe. And if you see a problem, you try to quantify it. Maybe the number of damaged plants. Uh, we also can use a tool called a sweep net. And all of our thresholds for our common pests during mid and late season, we have thresholds when you use a 15 inch diameter sweep net. So those thresholds are available for most of our common insect pests. And the other tool which is good to use is a drop cloth or a beet sheet. And basically uh, this you just lay between the rows and bend the plants over and shake the insects onto the, the sheet and you can count what species you have and how many you have. But uh, again, we have thresholds for number of insects per row foot as we do number per 25 sweeps with the sweep net. And the final thing, the final way you would scout soybeans, and again, this depends on the pest, is just estimating defoliation. So that's a, a good way uh, 
to kind of, if you've had low numbers of insects for an extended period of time, maybe not at the count for threshold, but there's a point you may need to intervene just to make sure you preserve that foliage so you can adequately fill out the pods. Now, the next few minutes, I'm gonna kind of walk you through the season and we'll talk about specific insects which we would expect to see uh, during that, those uh, growth stages of the plant. First, let's talk about seedling pest. And again, there are a lot of different insects uh, that can be on soybeans, but in our experiences in South Georgia, our number one seedling pest, and it's a sporadic pest, is lesser cornstalk borer. And uh, lesser cornstalk borer is typically a pest when it is hot and dry and uh, it can be problematic in soybeans. Uh, one of the things I encourage uh, our growers and agents to think about when we're planting soybeans, particularly if we're planting later in the year when lesser cornstalk borer numbers, we know they're in the environment. It's a pest of peanuts, for example. You know, if you're having lesser problems in peanuts, you know, and it's the end of June and you're planning to plant soybeans that week, you know, the likelihood is you could have some problems on soybeans. So our best uh, means of protecting a soybean from lesser cornstalk borers is to actually put a uh, lower span out at planting. You know, but that's additional money. Uh, maybe you'll get lessers, maybe you won't. That's a decision you'll have to make. Uh, we typically see them on our sandy soils, and I imagine y'all are mostly sandy soils. Uh, but we do have some heavier ground up here, but typically on sandy soils and typically on our later planted beans. Now, there's one unusual phenomenon with lesser cornstalk borer. So we have a fair amount of soybeans planted behind wheat. And sometimes our growers are in a hurry or for whatever reason, they decide to burn the field of wheat straw prior to planting soybeans. Well, I can tell you a burnt wheat field is a magnet for lesser cornstalk borer. If I were gonna to try to do research on lesser cornstalk borer, I would burn wheat straw in a field to put my plots. So if there's lessers in the area and you burn wheat straw, you should really think about using a prophylactic treatment. Now in terms of scouting for lesser cornstalk borer, these are very, uh, these are soil insects, they're caterpillars. Uh, you need to, uh, if you're a peanut farmer, I, I'm sure you know what the moths look like, but you can see those in a soybean field too. But lessers will actually be in the soil. Uh, they'll actually tunnel up into the main stem of a soybean seedling, and that will kill the soybean. So when you're walking your fields soon after emergence, basically what you're looking for is dead plants. And if you see a dead plant, you need to investigate that plant. You can take a knife and scratch around in the soil uh, and look for silk tubes. These are little silk casings, which lessers will be inside of that will be attached to the plant itself. But every dead plant, you look for lessers. And if you don't find one, look at the neighboring plants, which may not have be completely dead. Or if you see a plant that is just starting to wilt, that's what you would want to look for. But basically, we would recommend some type of rescue treatment if, if your stand was, was threatened or you know 10 percent of the plants were damaged. The problem with lessers is once they're in a the field we're not going to clean them up with anything. Uh, it's going to be a very tough situation. Sometimes if they're in there at high numbers you know we're just trying to salvage that stand. But again uh, you know it's a, a foliar application of, of uh, chlorpyrifos over the, over the top of the rows, what our best option is there. But again, seedling pests, they're very sporadic. Understand the risk, hot, dry conditions. Understand what's happening in your community, in your county. Make sure you talk to your county agent because if there's a problem with lessers and peanuts, for example, we need to be on the lookout for lessers in these late planted soybeans. All right, let's talk just a few minutes about kudzu bug, and I mentioned that earlier. And again, kudzu bug's a pest that's, that's kind of opposite the norm. Most of our insect pests are gonna be 
more likely to occur on our later planted beans. Kudzu bugs are going to be more likely to occur on our early planted beans. Kudzu bugs are very easy to scout for. Okay, very easy to scout for. They're very visible in the field. Um, one thing with kudzu bugs, if, if you've ever dealt with them, they're going to be way more common on the field margins. So if you're scouting a field trying to make a decision about whether or not to treat kudzu bugs, um, go ahead and walk in, into the interior portion of the field. If they're only on the edges, you know, I know growers who've treated the edges, but uh, but you'll see kudzu bugs. Uh, now the way we're going to scout for kudzu bugs uh, is with a sweep net. So we've done a lot of work across the southeast, a lot of entomologists worked, and we established a threshold for kudzu bugs of one immature kudzu bug per sweep. Now that's a very high number of insects, but again, you as a grower, you're not trying to eliminate insects, you as a grower are trying to maximize profits. And all of our work with kudzu bugs indicates that that's a very good threshold one immature kudzu bug per sweep with a sweep net. Now very few people, unless you're a professional scout, have a, have a uh, sweep net. So an alternative to using a sweep net is actually to walk across the field and just open the canopy of the soybean plant, you know, at 10 or 12 locations in the field. And when you open the canopy, you're likely going to see adults, but again, we're looking for the immature insects. Uh, the immatures almost appear aphid-like, but they're kind of brownish to greenish, and they'll be uh, on the main stem itself, uh, typically around the nodes uh, of the soybean plant. But if you open that canopy and you can see immature kudzu bugs at the majority of spots where you open the canopy, then it's time to go ahead and treat. Now, the one thing I want to say with kudzu bugs is don't get nervous, wait on the threshold, okay? Because what we've learned, um, if you spray too early, if you spray before you hit the immature threshold, you're going to have to spray again, I can assure you. And we know there's no penalty in terms of yield loss if we wait. So let's wait till we have the threshold and treat. And we don't want to get too aggressive on kudzu bugs because the, the products we're going to use are basically a bifenthrin type product or a lambda type product. Uh, maybe a couple other pyrethroids. Not all pyrethroids are created equal, okay? Particularly on this insect. But both bifenthrin and the lambda products are, are very active on this insect. Now, one of the problems with the pyrethroid, if we're spraying kudzu bugs, you know, in Georgia, when we hit thresholds, when we have them, it's usually the, somewhere around the third or fourth week of July. But, uh, you know, if you spray a pyrethroid to, to kill kudzu bugs, guess what else? You're gonna be disrupting, you're killing a lot of your beneficial insects. And we have data su to suggest when we make a kudzu bug spray early, we're gonna have about twice as many soybean loopers later in the year, just because we remove beneficial insects. So again, if you have a problem with kudzu bugs, let's address it. But if you don't, let's let Mother Nature do what she wants to do, is help you try to keep these pests below these threshold levels. Okay, now we want to talk a little bit about foliage feeding caterpillars. And again, there are a lot of different insects on soybeans, and we're only hitting the most common that we typically see in a given year. But I want to talk uh, about three caterpillars. Green clover worm, velvet bean caterpillar, and soybean looper. Now, when we start talking about foliage feeding caterpillars and, and any insect we deal with, proper ID is extremely important, okay? So you got to be able to identify these insects so we can make the right decision if we have to use an insecticide. So we have a little, what I call a little cheat sheet for scouting uh, soybean insects and uh, you'll be able to get these from your county agent but basically to identify these uh, caterpillars we're looking at abdominal prolegs okay 
And again, those are just some fleshy legs on the abdomen. It's got a pair of anal pro legs on the back end, but we're looking at how many pair of abdominal pro legs are present on these caterpillars. Soybean looper has two. Green clover worm has three. Velvet bean caterpillar has four, okay? It's extremely important you properly identify these foliage feeders. And the reason why is because their sensitivity to insecticides varies dramatically. Um, green clover worm, velvet bean caterpillar are relatively easy and inexpensive to control. Soybean looper is going to be way more costly to control, okay? So you've got to identify these correctly. A pyrethroid will do a great job on green clover worm and velvet bean caterpillar, but it's not going to touch a soybean looper, okay? That's why you have to properly identify these caterpillars. Now again, we have thresholds developed using a sweep net and also using a drop cloth. Um, you can use either one. I, I like the sweep because it's easier, but I feel like I get a better sense of what's in the field using a drop cloth. Uh, it just, it's just easier for me to work with. Uh, but e either one works fine. But if you're using a drop cloth, our threshold is eight caterpillars per row foot, okay? So eight per row foot. We know if we have eight per row foot, the likelihood of exceeding our defoli defoliation threshold is high. So we'd want to initiate a treatment even if defoliation wasn't very high because it's coming. So eight per row foot is our trigger. And again, knowing what species you have is going to determine what products you use. If you have soybean looper in the mix, you're going to be looking at products like Prevathon, Intrepid Edge, Steward, and maybe some others I'm uh, leaving off, but more costly products. If you're using a sweep net, our threshold for, uh, and again, you just accumulate those. You know, if you got five loopers and five velvet bean caterpillars, that's 10 that we're greater than eight per row foot. But using a sweep net's a little different. So for green clover worm and velvet bean caterpillar, we use 38 larvae per 25 sweeps as a threshold. Now soybean looper is 19 per 25 sweeps. It's basically half of what it is for velvet bean caterpillar and green clover worm. Now, when we were using the drop cloth, it didn't matter. But, the, but it's important that you understand this because if you're using a sweep net, we're just not as efficient as capturing soybean loopers with a sweep net as we are velvet bean caterpillar or green clover worm. And why is that? And the reason is soybean loopers tend to start in the lower part of the canopy and work their way up. So when soybean loopers are really getting going and you're in soybeans waist high or higher, you're just not going to be very efficient with your sweep net. And we take that into consideration when we've uh, got our threshold. So that's why those numbers are different. Um, but again, proper ID is so, so important. So you can make these insect counts, but also we can uh, estimate defoliation. And, and that's a, a really tough thing to do but we're looking at whole plant defoliation. And our threshold is basically uh, two-tiered for soybean foliage feeders. Prior to bloom, at least at Georgia, our threshold is 30% defoliation prior to bloom. And again, that's a lot of defoliation, but there's a lot of research to support that prior to bloom on vegetative soybeans, we're still fine. But once those beans begin blooming, and you're starting to set pods, our threshold's gonna to drop to 15%, okay? So it's a lot more serious situation to have foliage feeding once we're blooming and setting pods. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, there's a tendency for most of us when we look at a soybean field to overestimate uh, defoliation. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just gotta pick leaves. One trick I like to do is, is take a leaflet and say how much defoliation's here and, and let somebody try to estimate it. And then if you get a leaf the same size that has not been fed on, 
I'll break that lease into fourths and I'll start covering up holes. And you know, somebody may say, oh, that's 40%, but you have your 25% piece of leaf and you use about half of it. So, but again, that takes a little bit of time and experience, but the main point you need to understand is once we're setting pods and filling pods, we need to be a little more aggressive protecting the foliage. I will mention one thing uh, that we do in Georgia, we highly recommend in Georgia, is we encourage our growers to use demolin as a preventive insecticide at a late R2 or R3 growth stage. Um, this is a practice that's been used in Georgia for many years. Um, it actually started probably 20 years ago when we really didn't have products to control soybean looper. But Demlin is a growth regulator, an insect growth regulator, has very little impact on beneficial insects. Um, Demlin has extremely long residual activity. Demlin is very efficacious on green clover worm and velvet bean caterpillar. Now we timed Demlin to go out at R3 for a specific reason. Because on determinate soybeans, like your five, six, sevens that you're planting, once you hit R3, you have a pod about a quarter inch, three sixteenths inch in length, your canopy is developed. You have no new foliage growth. And if you put Demlin out at that point, you will have control of velvet bean caterpillar which can come in in September and really wreak havoc in a short amount of time, but you'll have season long control of that pest. Now the other beauty uh, you know, of that is a lot of times we'll have velvet bean caterpillar and, green, and uh, soybean looper in the field at the same time. Let's just say, for example, you remember our threshold was eight per row foot. Well, what if we had a, a situation where we had five velvet bean caterpillars and five loopers? Well, that would be 10 per foot. We'd need to treat. Well, you got loopers. You're fixing to spend $12, $15 to spray loopers. But if you had put Demlin on that field, you'd have zero velvet bean caterpillars. You'd still be below threshold on soybean looper. So it's kind of a proactive approach, but uh, uh, you know, most of our soybean growers who are really growing soybeans, trying to make a profit, uh, utilize that program. All right, the last group of insects we'll talk about is pod feeders. Pod feeding insects, primarily stink bugs, are the number one insect of soybeans in the state of Georgia. Basically, we have southern green stink bugs and brown stink bugs uh, that'll infest soybeans. Um, again, we can sample stink bugs with either uh, a sweep net or drop cloth. Uh, those numbers are on your list. So southern green and uh, brown stink bugs are our most common insects which we see in soybeans. Now, when we look at, uh, again, we have thresholds established using a sweep net and also using a drop cloth. It's also important to understand how stink bugs are damaging soybeans. Um, Stink bugs have sucking mouth parts. They actually penetrate the pod and feed it onto the developing seed. Now, if stink bugs get into a field during early reproductive stages, when pods are small, if they feed on the pod, the plant may abort the entire pod, okay? If they feed on them later during pod development, uh, the, the plant may abort a seed or the seed may just be damaged. But the potential of yield loss is much higher during early reproductive stages of the soybean plant. And for that reason, our threshold for stink bugs varies by growth stage of the plant. Um, basically, if you're R4 or earlier, we're gonna be much more aggressive. Our threshold's gonna be lower to protect those beans from soybeans because feeding may cause pod abortion. Once we get to R5 and greater, which is typically when we're gonna see stink bugs move in, um, our threshold is raised. But uh, just for example, um, during our early pod fill, uh, we're looking at 0.3 stink bugs per row foot. But once we get to R5, we raise it to one stink bug per row foot. But what you need to understand, 
is you need to start looking for stink bugs as soon as you start setting pods because they can be very damaging early in the year. So our threshold uh, during early pod fill was 0.3 stink bugs per foot of row. Um, basically what that is is one per three foot of row. Like typically when we use our drop cloth, we sample six foot of row. So if you were finding two stink bugs on six foot of row, that equ equates to 0.3 per row foot. We're just, I'm just in a, uh, a habit of, of, of talking about stuff and number per foot. Uh, but again, when you're using a drop cloth or a sweep net, you're gonna make a lot of samples in the field and you're gonna have to calculate averages. So it's just easier for me uh, when I calculate averages to go to number per row foot. If we look at products we're gonna use to uh, control stink bugs if we exceed thresholds, we're primarily talking about pyrethroids. Now I do want to mention one other stink bug species, uh, and it's called red-banded stink bug. It's something we do not see frequently, but it's something every soybean grower needs to understand. I know uh, two years ago we had some serious issues in Seminole County, Georgia down around Donaldsonville. And so that's getting, you know, closer, closer to the panhandle. But uh, red banded stink bug is, is a much smaller stink bug than we're accustomed to seeing, like a southern green, and literally has a red band running horizontal across its back. Basically the threshold for red banded stink bugs is four per 25 sweeps. Basically, you're going to kill a red banded stink bug twice for every green stink bug, and you can use our normal threshold, but they're much more damaging. Even though they're a smaller insect, they're just much more damaging to the soybean seed itself. The other thing I'll mention about red banding, they can be a pest of soybean basically until you harvest, okay? So just because the soybeans are turning yellow and maybe you have normally quit managing other insects, you can't quit on red banded stink bug. For example, in the Mid-South where they grow a lot of indeterminate group fours, they'll desiccate prior to harvest. Uh, folks out there will mix an insecticide with the desiccant because you still have another couple weeks before you would harvest. All right, the last thing we'll cover is just when can you terminate insecticide use in soybean? Basically, when you get to R6.5, well, what is R6.5? Basically, that's when you get to R6 and you add seven days. Well, what's R6? So I had to write this down. But R6 is when you have full seed, okay? That's when the pod contains seed that completely fill the pod. So R6 is when you can quit managing insects in soybeans, R6.5, R6 plus seven days, with the exception of that red banded stink bug. And again, don't forget that. That's something you need. If you hear about those in your community, you need to be watching that closely. Now I grew up in Georgia and uh, I like to simplify things. That R6.5 gets kind of hard for me to understand. But an old farmer told me one time, he says, son, if the soybeans are still green, they're green for a reason. And in reality, if you start looking at your soybeans, if they're still green, you're probably not there. But when they start to turn and get a little yellow tint to them, you're probably really close to R6.5. Again, I enjoyed taking the time uh, to visit with you on soybean insects today. Um, I'm Philip Roberts, uh, located in the Tifton campus in Tifton, in Tifton, Georgia. And if you have additional questions about anything I covered, contact your county agent.